has, has basically two items on it. Um, comments and input. Okay. Well, we're going to be talking about comments and input on the foundational renovation plan budget. Um, looks like then there's a second report from school personnel on the facilities committee. Um, mm -hmm. And then prioritization of, of additional proposed improvements. On the agenda up there, it's got community comments at the end. However, as we're going along, um, once the committee has talked about a particular thing, you know, I'm open to comments. You don't have to sign in or anything. I am going to try to get Craig here to be our timekeeper of three minutes. So the comments you're making, if you could please try to keep the, make them succinct. I think three minutes gives people enough time to say what they need to say, but say it in a succinct way. Um, so the first um, item is going to is uh, the first uh, comments and input on the foundational renovation plan budget was done by the part of the committee which is the building professionals plus me part of the reason for this is that we are we have to operate by sunshine law so we can only have a minority of, of the uh, members of the committee talking outside of the public meetings and you know part of the way we put the committee together with you know building professionals and then educators um it, you know it, it's kind of natural in my mind when you're looking at building uh mechanical systems etc that the building professionals want to be able to interact amongst themselves about those kind of issues educational issues the educators want to talk about so that is pretty much how the committee has been functioning between meetings um, so we put a document together providing an update assessment uh, of the process to this point from our perspective. And we, um, we had a, well actually Dorothy and Scott Five were also in on a um, Zoom meeting that we did with Michael Murdoch of Moats and THP, who is their subcontractor, Tim Bennett from THP. Uh, to, we, and we went over, we reviewed line by line uh, the the budget and uh, the different line items on the budget that was their part of the budget. Um, the part that Mike Richley did, uh, we did have not reviewed that. Um, so um, I just want to go over again because it seems like um, it's important to just remember what the charge of the committee was and the goal. Um, the committee was created uh, at the beginning of the new of the new school board uh, in la last winter, and it was it was created by the school board uh, really in response to the fact that uh, we had had a school levy the bond that had failed, and that two members who were elected to the school board had run on the idea of renovation and that this is something that the community had been asking to look at, a renovation plan for the last few years. Um, so uh, after the election, I talked to TJ first as, you know, the, as the experienced member of the school board about the idea of creating a facility committee and that it would be natural and I asked that I could lead that as a person who was, was a proponent of a renovation plan. Uh, the school district agreed to this, and the school board agreed to this. And I just want to point out that the goal was to have a full understanding whether a comprehensive permanent improvement plan could match the facilities with the district's educational needs in an economically and environmentally sustainable way. And we said in this, and Dorothy and I wrote this together, by comprehensive permanent improvement plan, we mean a plan of maintenance, upgrades, and capital projects for our facilities. Um, part of what we said we would do was uh, put together a prioritized list of upgrades. Uh, we said the committee would help in the hiring of an architect and engineering resources, and then that the committee 
would interface and work with the professionals hired, providing information gathered and ongoing input. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out the board resolved to appoint people to the committee, both trades people and professionals with a relevant knowledge base regarding buildings and building systems and their maintenance and renovation. And also, um, the daily users, users and they, they are our educators, uh, of our current buildings to provide input regarding the facility strengths, challenges, and needs for effective education of our children. Um, so, in our report today, we were going to do a PowerPoint, but that kind of fell to the wayside. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things that we said. First, we want to make sure it's understood our two school facilities are deemed sturdy and structurally sound. We felt like that was important to say. Um, we also, our part of the committee anyway, that, so the people who put this report together were the building professionals and myself, so it was not the whole committee. Um, we feel it's inaccurate to characterize the draft drawings and budget costs as a final or complete concept of our renovation plan, um, as, it, as some people have been understanding it. These are drafts in need of further investigation. That was always the plan that the committee, yes, we would hire these professionals, but then the committee um, would be interfacing, working with them, um, vetting, and having critical conversations with them. And part of the reason that makes a lot of sense is like Craig Conrad, who, who worked for 27 years as our, as our uh, maintenance supervisor and who continues to assist him from time to time when Craig Carter needs time off. So he's very knowledgeable of the systems. He knows a lot of the history of the systems. And we felt like that knowledge was very important because you know the maintenance plan advisors, they're coming in and they're looking at things, but they don't know that whole history. And, it's, and, um, it's, and I don't know that Craig Carter had a huge amount of time to go over all of that detail. Um, let's see. We had said we wanted plans at various price points. And that hasn't exactly happened. We kind of came up, we kind of ended up falling into a situation where we have what we what um, Mike brutally called foundational renovation, and then he included the other items that were being talked about, uh, particularly coming from our educators, um, in terms of what a renovation plan could look like. Um, I wanted Mike to talk about you know this idea of the, the idea of various price points was something that Mike had recommended that we tried to come up with some cost points that we thought um, we could be that our community could support as a way to provide some structure to a plan that we would be trying to put together. But I'm going to let Mike talk a little bit about the various price points, the foundational, how it became. <coughs> how the one section became called the foundational renovation. And um, the idea that, as I said, all of those other issues beyond the foundational really have not been discussed by the committee or the community. It's just, well, these were uh, improvements that our uh, administrative staff working with Mike um, looked at that would be really great to be able to uh, do for our district. Sure. So yes, I was hired to support the committee in, uh, on the renovation plan options. And I wouldn't get too hung up on the word foundational, but the thought was that there would be a uh, base amount of work that would address all the major problems with the existing building. So shell, you know, roofing, uh, walls, masonry, windows, and all your interior systems, your mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems. And then hit what, I, what I've kind of heard is kind of critical issues like building security, creating secure vestibules, and kind of critical um, user, uh, 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 student issues like restrooms that are kind of working So those were formed around what I call the, the foundational plan, because if you do that, you could still do all these other other things. It's kind of the uh, 
the foundation on which any plane can be built on. So, for example, if you have a, um, an approved electrical service or new mechanical system side for expansion, you can do a lot of things down the road that right now you can't do because these systems don't have that, that capacity. So that was the thought process. And really this is the, um, you know, I'm here to provide information, not to, not to recommend, or, um, but just to bring my experience about what I've seen. And the upside of a renovation plan is you can do it at various price points. So there can be a conversation around how much we want to invest, what does that look like? Uh, versus new building, which I know we're not talking about. You can't have to do a new building. You have to fully build the building and complete it. So the, the renovation option does give districts flexibility on how much uh, they want to put into it. So the foundation plan is just that. And then the, the other projects uh, came out of engagement I had with uh, principals uh, and your administrators on other parts and pieces of the plan that they would really like to, to look at. You know, fully renovating classrooms, um, uh, fully renovating up through the second and third floors of the tower, renovating this floor of the building, um, replacing the modulars with new construction, uh, adding multiple music for more of the spaces at both schools. So those pieces were were added to that second column, uh, and then it adds up to the total. And essentially, the uh, the total vision, what I was trying to do is say, can we put together a vision on paper that addresses nearly all of the expressed needs that I heard throughout the process, uh, with one exception, which is the high school gym, right? That kind of could not accomplish that with this plan. Um, but that was that was the goal. So that when you look at what's on the draft drawings from, from December 8th or 9th, uh, that's essentially the total renovation plan. And then the way this was budgeted was a way to peel out what are the foundational pieces and what are the additional pieces that could be added onto that to get you to a total. So really the goal was to provide a basis for a conversation, for the engagement, for the work by this committee to then you know, wrestle with that, figure out where do you want to be and what wants to be in. So I, I think I want to go over again what's in, what's included in the foundational renovation, um, and I do want to say an issue, a word, a a uh, phrase that's been uh, being used that I ended up stop using after talking to some educators about it was this phrase educational adequacy and the idea that the foundational renovation plan was not about educational adequacy but the other pieces were. Um, after looking at it a bit, it's clear to me that a lot of the foundational um, items are about educational adequacy. I know Dorothy early on was uh, was emphasizing the importance of air quality in a school. <laughs> uh, and you know, so when you think about the kind of HVAC and air exchange uh, work that's going to be done in the foundational renovation plan, that is um, educational adequacy. That is an educational adequacy item. But anyway, so let me just go over again. Um, it would re so a foundation of renovation would replace all mechanical systems, including replacing all HVAC systems. It would add air conditioning to the high school gym. The plan also includes dedicated ventilation systems, meeting air exchange criteria as prescribed by the current Ohio building code. These improvements would resolve and address air quality and environmental comfort issues. The plan includes extensive renovations to restroom facilities that will also make them ADA compliant. All ceilings and lighting will be replaced. The PA and technology systems will be updated. Um, I ended up asking Michael Murdoch in an email, you know, what exactly does the technology improvements include? And it, inclu it includes a lot. Um, so, um, According to Michael, they, it includes a new internet service to each building, significantly increased bandwidth, internet cable to each classroom, wireless routers in each classroom, hallways, audiovisual equipment, electronic boards, and teaching aids, charting, charging carts, and special power internet connections for updates, IT closets, new servers and switches, security cameras, card swipe system, intruder system, clock system, visitor badging system, 
It would also include some hardware, computer lab, 3D printers, simulators, etc. Um, it just struck me that we're spending $650,000 on technology in the in Mills Lawn and a, a million dollars in the middle high school. There's a lot involved there, and we want to, and I wanted to make it make sure that people were understanding what that would be involved. Um, it will include an update of the electric system. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Where needed, and additional power outlets to meet classroom and workroom needs. It will replace roofs, needing replacement, and plan for the future needs of those currently not needing replacement. Um, all single pane windows and those in poor condition in both facilities will be replaced with thermal insulated windows. All identified concrete masonry and facade repairs are included in the plan. The foundational plan includes renovation at Mills Lawn and trips to create a secure vestibule and upgrades and, and reconfiguration of offices, including the front office, the receptionist and secretary offices, the principal and counselor office, the clinic, and a special education flex space. It will also include associated bathrooms. The van trailer will be replaced with a new constructed van room. In the high school, the foundational plan will include additional new construction of a secure vestibule, an open an office suite for the receptionist, secretary, principal, assistant principal, the conference room, and administrative storage work area. It will also include deep renovation to provide an office suite for a high school guidance office, psychologist, therapist, middle school guidance, special ed offices, and a clinic with associated bathroom. And then I put in here that things that are not included um, that we agree should be included would be replacing furniture that's in poor condition, flooring, and window treatments such as blinds and shades. Um, there are there may be other items currently in the second column of the initial report that need to be included in the list for foundational renovation. And I do want to say that as we've looked carefully, and of course we've been hearing, you know, about the modular units or the shoebox, and we have we believe the commit the the building professionals and I, who am not a building professional, um, that there may be a reuse of the units um, that could be of value to the district, but we recognize they're not ideal for classrooms. So what we put in our foundational budget does not include the need for the new construction of classrooms that would need to be built to replace those. Um, that is a $2.7 million additional cost. However, if you go through um, the square footage costs that are associated with the modular, as well as other costs associated with the modular, the actual, and we would, we would be reducing that if we were getting rid of the modulars, um, then the actual cost for that new, those new uh, routes would be something like 1.5 million, um, the difference in the cost. Um, so Jerry, so, We've been, you know, after we talked with, uh, in that Zoom conversation with Michael Murdoch um, and Tim Bennett, um, and we've done other um, kinds of research. We had um, electricians for Dayton Bonham Electric. It was the owner plus the fellow who's like the head of their commercial division. They came and looked at our electrical system because um, Michael Murdoch of Motes agreed that basically their look, they didn't open the panels uh, because they're not electricians, so they didn't really have an in-depth look at our electric system. So um, so we did have them come, we got input from them. We've talked to fire safety professionals, you know, about the issue of, um, you know, the, the, what's, what would be necessary to ensure fire safety, which of course everybody wants to be sure of. Um, and so, anyway, Jerry put together a spreadsheet looking at possible uh, savings, although we do feel like we need more information in order to really be able to nail down some of these higher cost items um, by a little more assessment that would cost a little bit more money. So, I'll let Jerry take over. Okay, well, first of all, um, as you just mentioned, we at the school district hired uh, uh, 
uh, mechanical, uh, electrical, plumbing, engineering consultants, folks, and uh, structural and building envelope, uh, professional THP. And uh, they were charged with doing a visual inspection of our facilities and coming up with recommendations for items which they feel needed attention. Okay, and the uh, uh, building uh, professional part of this facilities committee, uh, so the public knows what the qualifications of those folks are, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Judith already mentioned Craig and his association with the school over two decades. Myself, I'm a retired engineer. Um, I spent my career in project management and facilities engineering. Uh, I retired from a firm after three decades of service with uh, a group that designed industrial facilities projects of values, values up to $300 million. And our firm uh, completed various disciplines including foundation design, structural steel, reinforced concrete, mechanical systems, plumbing, electrical uh, distribution, uh, controls, and instrumentation. So I personally uh, have a, some familiarity with all those fields. Uh, also on our committee is uh, Michael Slaughter, who's an electrical engineer, David Roche, who's a professional building inspector, and Richard Zoff, who has extensive experience in building and maintenance and has been a longtime volunteer with the uh, Dell Springs School System. So, um, I um, accepted uh, or volunteered for this position uh, for the uh, purpose of vetting whatever recommendations were proposed by the uh, mechanical and structural contractor. I, I had previously been concerned that uh, evaluations done by the Ohio Phyllis Facilities uh, Construction Commission and um, uh, Fanning Howie for the last uh, 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 levy attempt were not vetted. They were just taken as uh, gospel. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some information which most likely needed to be transmitted to these uh, folks had not been transmitted. So we attempted, uh, we being the committee, attempted to uh, bring the, uh, our consultants up to speed um, the best we could, given the limited opportunity we've had for interchange. So, uh, as I said, our consultants issued a report based on their visual inspections only. And after going through their report, uh, it appeared to the committee that there were various uh, assumptions that were made uh, that were incorrect. There were some mistakes made. Um, and uh, saw opportunities for savings. Keep in mind that the key word here is opportunity. Uh, the document uh, which I'm referring to uh, does not say that these are absolute savings. What, what the intent of this document is to identify potential savings if further investigative work is done. And I might uh, start out with a couple of, of items. Uh, one is a comprehensive roof evaluation. Uh, the roofs on the school are various ages. Some of the roofs are still under warranty 
and capable of being restored for a long life. Uh, that evaluation uh, would cost approximately $5,000. Another item is evaluation of the condition of our hydronic heating piping. Uh, the only way to really do that is to um, extract uh, what they refer to as coupons or samples of the piping and have them uh, looked at in a laboratory situation by a metallurgist. Uh, then the life of that piping can be reliably predicted. The other issue is underground piping. Uh, that can be evaluated by uh, camera systems that are inserted into the underground piping for inspection purposes. All these three systems, which I mentioned, have been programmed in the estimate for total replacement, regardless of the condition that they're in. Uh, another item uh, which needs additional evaluation is a, is a follow-up uh, electrical evaluation. Uh, to determine what is actually uh, in the buildings. Uh, this would be done by an electrical, uh, a licensed electrical contractor. All these items <coughs> come most likely at a cost of about $10,000 with the uh, total. Total. Yeah, yeah total. With, with the uh, possibility of saving <coughs> upwards of $8 million out of the estimate that was presented to us by the consultant. Now again, all these items are not are uh, to be verified by additional work. We're not saying that this is fact. Okay. Uh, as an example of uh, some of the items that uh, we called out um, was one was fire. <coughs> Uh, the committee has been encouraging our consultants to uh, have a pre-planning meeting with the uh, billing inspector or as they're referred to at, at, as the authority having jurisdiction. That's, that's uh, in our case, is a company called National Inspection Corporation, which handles uh, Yellow Springs building permits. Uh, that hasn't been done, but uh, conversations that I've had with acquaintances that are uh, fire safety and building inspection professionals have indicated that it is very unlikely that the AHJ will require our buildings to have uh, fire suppression systems. Um, Which means sprinklers. <laughs> it doesn't it mean means you don't. Sprinklers in the building and a separate uh, two pump system which maintains pressure in the sprinkling system. But it also do. comes with most likely an increase in the supply line size to the buildings to supply adequate water. If it was needed for safety, you know, we would be totally for that. But one of the first reports we got from uh, boats, uh, from boats engineering, was a re was included a lot of statistics about why, you know, upgrading our current systems without fire suppression is extremely safe. And there was he had a lot of data to back that up. So we're just. You know, we want certainly what's here to, to, for the buildings to be very safe uh, for all those inside of the building uh, and to, you know, but um, the question is, you know, what is what is really needed uh, in terms of for that safety? A new fire alarm uh, system, uh, fire detection system is included in the foundational estimate. Um, And then also, if you don't have a fire suppression system, there, there are building, fire resistant building uh, uh, 
items that need to be considered, like fire doors, uh, you know, material selections, those type of things, uh, which would also be included in the foundational estimate. But the total fire protection package and the estimate for both buildings is almost a million dollars. So if, if that's a cost that doesn't have to be uh, incurred, that's an opportunity to uh, uh, pursue some of these other uh, uh, items which will add to the educational experience. Uh, another item that was in the uh, estimate which we took uh, issue with was uh, 83 exterior gym doors at a cost replacement, total replacement, at a total cost of $270,000. So we don't know where that came from. <laughs> I, I uh, challenged somebody to find 83 exterior gym doors in this high school. Another item that was in there which we took issue with was $110,000 for replacement of the ceiling in the gym, which doesn't have a ceiling. So that's just an example of some of the things that we found uh, in the estimate. Um, trying to think if there's other things here that, uh, you know, it's all, it's all in this uh, spreadsheet. Um, you know, many of the, the, there was a wholesale replacement of building windows and doors in the estimate. Building windows, most of the windows in our buildings, with the exception of the 1952 portion of Mills Lawn School, are thermally insulated, uh, watertight windows. There may be a few of those which maybe uh, have broken the thermal seal or may possibly be leaking. So the assumption was made uh, subject to further inspection, that we would not be replacing all the windows in our buildings that have thermally insulated watertight windows. Um, trying to think of, uh, uh, associated with that too, is that most of the exterior doors in our facilities have been replaced and are in fairly good operating condition. That also needs to be evaluated on an individual basis rather than plan for a wholesale replacement. So those are just a few items. Uh, you know, the point I want to make is the what we're the point of this document is to identify areas where there's possible savings that can be attributed to the tune of eight million dollars if there's further investigation done to confirm that. Um, I think that's all I have. Okay. Uh, Craig, Michael, Richard, do any of you have anything to add? I, I think he pretty much covered it, but on the electrical side, uh, we had Moats look at it, and we had uh, an outside person take a look at it. Again, it's a cursory overlook and view of the main panels and the secondary panels. We kind of discussed maybe replacing the main panel it is safe, but it would require further looking at the testing, shutting the power down, the fuse switches, uh, and then going on into the secondary panel. As far as replacing all the wire, that may not be necessary. We can own those lines out, verify that they're good, that are in conduit, they can continue to work. You don't need to pull all that wire out and start from zero. Uh, and that's pretty much where we stand on the electrical. Again, further further assessment with a, with a check uh, with equipment and a uh, licensed electrician will give us more data on that. The foundational cost include replacement of the, of the two main sub Craig? Um, <clears throat> I guess I'd speak specifically about the roofing. Um, we have the 2002 additions, which at this point are just over 20 years old and did not need uh, to be re-roofed, they could be restored. And I think 
possibly there's a larger sections of the main building here and at Mills Lawn that also could um, have restoration and they could be brought back up to a 20 year warranty condition like you get with a complete tear off and new roof. So the possibility of saving and, and you're not, we're not saving money to be cheap, we're saving money because it doesn't need to be done. If your car needs a great job, you don't go out and buy a new car. <coughs> so if you don't need to do it, why should you spend the money there? So that's what we're looking at, is if we can restore these roofs and get them up to like new condition, then that's the way we can go and possibly save a lot more money to put into this um, other side of the bucket you know, where we can get a lot more things that, uh, that we need, you know, inside for uh, education. I was going to say, in terms of uh, restoration, we were told that a restoration would cost less than half of a new tear-off rebuild. So, if you look at the cost on the uh, original plan, uh, talk about the cost of roofs are very expensive I mean there's a big cost savings potentially there now if there is roofs that are still under warranty um, so they don't need to be replaced but in a few years the warranty goes off so th there has to be planning done about you don't just replace everything now because now is when we're going to do this big bond and we're going to just do everything if it doesn't need to be done but we do have to then as a district plan for you know, at the point when those things are needed, that you've got the monies to do it. So that's that's another piece. It doesn't need to be done now. Now, when we went to Oakwood, um, they replaced 50%, I think they said, of their roof. Am I right about that? I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, when they did a big renovation. Um, so I'm sure they're, they've got a plan for when those other roofs do need to be replaced, which is gonna be before the ones that they just replaced, you know, where's the money? So there, there's planning there that has to take place. I guess there's one other thing I'd like to say about, um, you know, the only way to find out if these roofs can be restored is to have them evaluated. So, you know, we need to get a professional up there and they can do scans on the roof to find out exactly what condition the roofs are in, every square inch. So um, they can go in and they can determine whether it is feasible or not feasible to restore the roof. And the criteria they use is if more than 25% of your insulation in your roof is wet, then they'll usually recommend a re-roof, uh, re tear off, start from scratch. If less than 25% is uh, wet, then typically they can uh, restore the roof. Now it also has to do, they'll take core samples in certain places, because it also has to do with top layers that they put on. These are what they call built-up roofs, so there's different plies that go on top of each other. And what they'll do is they'll test those thicknesses to make sure that they're adequate to uh, support a restoration. In which case, if they are, then they're just fine with restoring and giving us back a warning. And so they're in like new condition when they're done. I'd also like to add in our conversations with uh, Moats and THP, they felt that these uh, additional ins investigations that we're talking about here were prudent measures. Did you want to say anything, Richard? Because then it well, I've, I think I've essentially done the same things, is look down the list of, of recommended changes and then look at, in my case, mostly at Mills Lawn and say, oh, we need to repoint all the brick. No, the, the 2002 portion of the building, the brick is in perfect condition. There's not any indication of any problems at this point. And when I talked with with the representative who looked at that, he said, oh, if you've got more information to give me, I'd like to have it. Okay, so their, their visual <coughs> that they did was essentially to get the extent of, of the building and what, you know, was it a brick building? Was it a this building or that building? And then they just applied general terms to the whole building without looking at the different parts of the building. And <coughs> 
did the same thing with, as we said, we talked about exterior doors. It didn't make any difference whether it was a brand new door or an original door. All the doors needed to be replaced. And back and forth on that, oh well, no, if these doors, you know, are of a certain age and they meet all the requirements and they're in good working order, they don't need to be replaced. So it's, it's just that fine tuning that we've been working on rather than this broad brush of, of just counting the doors and saying you need this many new doors or this, this much new brick. Whatever it happens. Um, I just want to also add, I think people get a misrepresentation of renovation, especially if it's deep renovation. Um, we have uh, two examples of that. One is the Mills Lawn Gym. Half of the Mills Lawn Gym was built in 1952. And if you walk in there, unless you know what it used to look like, I don't think you can tell which side is new and which side is not new. The same here, behind the stage, there's two hallways that go to the outside, and then there's a connecting co corridor. There's two classrooms there that were renovated. And when that project was completed in 2002, you couldn't tell the difference between the new section and the renovated section because it was that nice. So renovation can really be really nice um, and it doesn't have to follow the same footprint that what you have or what you you know originally have it doesn't have to be the same so you know, round about way. So you know you can you can look at blueprints and drawings of where classrooms are now, but that doesn't necessarily mean, if they're going deep renovation, that that's where it's going to end up. They can move things based on uh, teachers' needs or wants, and uh, renovation can really make a, a building look, look brand new. Mike, did you want to make any comments or comments? No, I would just like to add one more thing is that um, I think I'm recommending that the foundational plan include storm shelters at both sites. And that's because the moratorium ended on November 30th. And right now, law says a uh, public school district is going through a alteration renovation addition, particularly if we're talking about one that could be in the order of magnitude of $25 million, um, that a storm shelter is required. That's basically where we're at, unless uh, the legislature adds a, extends the moratorium again or something like that. But so right now, for planning purposes, I think we need to plan on it. And what that would mean, uh, and you haven't seen this on paper yet, is like for example, uh, in the foundational plan, we had the office addition. But next to the office addition, we could do a an enlarged band room, even bigger than the band room that was originally envisioned about 2,300 square feet and build that as the storm shelter because it has to be sized to um, handle all the students and all the teachers. So the band room that was in the foundational plan of, or in the final plan that was 2,100 square feet is not quite big enough to house all of the students. So maybe that thing gets a little bigger and maybe it's a recycle hall or something like that. And the same thing on Mills Lawn is in the foundational plan we had that one music room. Perhaps that music room grows in size to accommodate students and teachers, and that is the, the storm shelter. So that's something that um, I would just recommend if, if this list is being considered, that we could add, add those to the foundational plans that you cited. What would be the cost? Uh, at uh, Mills Lawn, $1,740,000, and at Mills School High School, one, just call it $2 million. Uh, that's about 3,330 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 square feet at the high school. That's $600 a square foot, which is the $450 square foot base plus the $150 square foot hardening. Uh, and then at Mills Lawn, around 2,900 square feet at $600 a square feet. Square foot equals 1,000. I guess I have a question. So for storm shelters, like how many square feet per person? Sure. So uh, you determine your occupants, um, and it is five square feet per person is the law. 
but then you also have to enlarge the square footage by approximately 20% because let's say inside that band room there's furniture or instruments or something like that. You, you have to take that into consideration and upsize the square footage. We have to include a restroom, toilets, laboratories, emergency power, We're done with our presentation, so. <coughs> Question? Yes. Or a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the uh, additional electrical contractor that was affected, and I assume that this was recommended by Moats that they recommended this group, or I didn't, I didn't know about this happening. No, it was, uh, it was a contractor known by a member of the committee. Um, it's a large electrical contractor, I believe. Did we, did we open the panels? Because in the presentation you say that... Um, they opened the main panel. Did you look at, They looked at the main panel here in the high school. One of the up to the world. We looked at the fuses in the main panel. Yeah, we didn't open the panel. We didn't open the whole panel. We didn't open the whole panel. Okay. The whole panel. They, they are saying that we should have uh, a closer look, they were. Uh, the placement yes. of that panel was included in the foundation. But it, what I'm meaning is that both Mott's and Burnham had a visual yes. look at it. They are, they are visual. It's not like one got more of a look into it than the other. That's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to determine here. Is that, am I getting this right? I think okay. so. I, I wasn't involved when Mott's was looking at it. But it's a visual. Just ask one question about: are, are, are we still talking about the base project, foundational as one project, and then the rest is a separate? I mean, the way I'm envisaging it is that the foundational we all know that needs to get done. What's in the foundational renovation? Basically, it's the high priorities that absolutely need to be done no matter what, um, and then. We said in the charge we would have, uh, basically we were calling for material plans at different various price points. And the various price points thing got kind of lost in the shuffle. So, you know, part of the reason I put on the agenda tonight, prioritization of the additional proposed improvements was because there was the idea to charge asked for us to prioritize. Now, we know the foundational stuff is a priority. There's nothing to really talk about in terms of prioritization, I don't think. But the other items which were uh, put on the list by the educate, our educator leadership, um, we don't feel like we're the ones to prioritize that. But the reason to do it is for the school, school board who has to ultimately look at this information and with the community try to figure out what to do. So if several things on that second list get added, uh, that would be um, that would be the renovation plan if that's what the school, the school board decided. But if there is something like, you know, we've been hearing about for years the need for a theater. We know it's not in this plan, but we know that it is uh, aspirational. Was the terms of aspirational and enhancement, you know, as a way of trying to you know, you have your foundational, then you have an enhanced additional things, <coughs> and, and then aspirational is the idea that there's sometimes there may be things like at Oakwood, they, they weren't able to do all the things they had hoped to do. And so those things, that doesn't mean they gave up on doing them, I don't believe, was my impression when we were there. But it's something that would come to the future. Let me ask again that question because this is where I'm confused to, and I'm going to direct it to you, Mike. Because I've heard you in the past saying that you were not recommending a civil plan approach. You were recommending a one intervention approach, right? But then tonight you use language like later on work to be done down the road. And so I'm trying to understand here what the best approach and the most the smartest approach is for our money. Are we looking at one intervention, one plan, or are we looking at a first plan that should be followed by another? because this is really changing the conversation about how we're looking at that. So my instincts tell me yeah. that 
foundational plan, or a, a plan that costs $25 million, it's going to be a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift in any community, let alone Yellow Springs. So the, the thought of going out and doing a $25 million plan, but then kind of telling the community, hey, we're not done, we got another 15 that's going to be coming down the pipe, I think that would be a challenge. That would be a challenge for any community to kind of get yes. that sold. So my recommendation, based on your past history, is that it would probably be a better use of all of your political energy to come up with the plan that kind of fixes things for the foreseeable future and not have to say, we, we got to come back and yeah, years. So we're not talking about a phased-in plan. We're not talking about a multiple-step plan. We're could, talking about one. You could do it. But I think that's where it came from in my recommendation was based on Everything I've seen yeah. you've gone through over the last five years, that I think you've got a shot, right? And and it would, in my view, make the most sense to try to tackle it in one shot. I offer clarification. Yes, we're talking about one plan, but the work will be phased over a period of time. You're not going to do everything in one year. Well, you. Um, my recommendation is one, essentially one contract for, yes. for the uh, two sites, and then they would be a, it would be in this case a phased renovation over at least a 15 month period of time to do it. Yeah, but okay. it would be phased in under one contract. Yeah. But you're not saying you've got these two lists. One's you know, 25 or 23 million. The other one's whatever it is, 22 million or whatever. And you've got to include all that. That's what's the that was never your intention, was it? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not here to say if you don't do the $15 million plan, you're missing it. Because I think if, if you just did the $25 million, I think you'd be getting a lot. Um, but it's not really my job to say you have to, you know, the whole thing or nothing. So, so I think we're ready to jump in to our, to our response. Any I respect you, but your ranking is not in place to say that. And I think the whole plan, you know, I'm not sure where this notion that we would be satisfied with renovation came from. I think we've said all along, if it was renovation to like new, great. I said that in another meeting. So I'm not sure where that came from. You know, we've prepared remarks, and, and by we, I mean myself, the treasurer, both of my principals, and the two teachers that sit on this committee. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. It's in board docs. There are copies. But I think I'm going to say again, and, I, and I, I'm willing to take criticism again, but I, I need to see our children. And so I appreciate you saying, foundational stuff is really educational adequacy because we would have said that all along as well. And so hopefully, Judith, when you talk to educators, you talk to our educators because if not, that really is another way of devaluing the expertise. You know, I tried to talk to our educators that aren't on the committee because I can't talk to the ones on the committee without violating the sunshine. You can talk to them. I, you, no, you can't. You talk, you can only to, talk, you talk to all these people. You can talk to two people over here as well. But, so, but when I, I tried know. to talk to a teacher, I was told as a school board member that's not appropriate. So I've been talking to educators, but they're not been met the people who work at the schools. And that's been my rationale. So I, I've tried to define educational adequacy. You know, are we set up to really complete our mission? our mission as a school district. You know, these buildings, when built, were state of the art. Times have changed. Education is different. And, and so it, it's everything. It's We need a, a different uh, serving area. We need a wider corridor. Two, we need spaces, learning stairs, or classrooms that can accommodate different furniture. You know, it, it's bigger than just, you know, we need more technology. I mean, all the technology, I want to make sure everyone understands that, that Moat's quoted, we have that. We don't have a smart board in every room, but we have wireless routers, and we have huge bandwidth, and we have all of that. 
But what, what the educators, the teachers, and my principals and I talked to Mike about was in a renovation plan that is not a new build, in a renovation plan, how can we get close to meeting what we feel are our educational needs? They're not enhancements, they're not aspirations, those are terms we have never used. That plan did it. Could we have had other things? Yes, but I think if that plan were actualized, everyone employed by the district would be, wow. So I'm confused where this, this anti-renovation piece has come from. Um, but I'm, I'm going to move on in our document. I think, um, again, this is, we discussed this and this is our piece. We feel like we're, we're, we have these two priorities. It's either about the money or it's about a future investment. And we have to decide what it's about. Because this investment, Mike is right in the sense that this is our, our one bite of the apple. Jay said that before. This is our one bite. So we better get what we need right now. So is it about the money in the short term? Is it about an investment in our children and our community in the long term? You know, these buildings, whatever we do, should be sufficient for our kindergarten students' grandchildren. That's what we need to think about. Because somebody thought about that 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. Somebody thought about that. Uh, I, I'm going to call on my colleagues to jump in. I, I guess I'm confused because I, I came on this committee mm -hmm. to look at the buildings. Right and provide some expertise based on the modes right. engineering or right. and THP. And we've done that. We asked questions for clarifications from both parties. Um, got some back and forth feedback and found some cost savings for that part so that you can move forward and the school board can decide whatever they want to do, whatever that means, whether that's a or in it, whatever, whatever that means. I, I felt like that was what we were chartered to do, and that's what we've done, I believe, right. unless you're thinking something different. No, I mean, all I these think semantics with the words and what's included, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I think the so. committee, Mike, you're right, has come up with what they were slated to do. Were, were there errors that 83 doors? Yes, clearly. And if we but didn't scrutinize that, we're doing a disservice to the community. I, I, I understand that, but what the plan you have is, okay, so now we know it's not $50 million, it's 49 and a half, or it's 41. I, I, I'm not disputing, Mike, that that was your charge. It, it certainly was, but I feel like the work is done. When I see then an, an, an item that says, now we need to prioritize the rest of the plan, then I'm thinking, that's something different. Because if we're asked to say, hey, what are your needs? And we were asked, and we communicated. And so now to have to say, okay, of these needs, now we have to prioritize that, I guess, is the piece that's confusing me. Yeah, I would say that I, I keep getting confused by this foundational and additional. Because at the last meeting, we said phase approach isn't. We agreed to that. So at that point to me, there is no foundational, there is no additional. It's one plan. It's total. Look at the, and, and I understand how it's broken out, but that means that we're looking at the total plan only. And additional is scary because if you ask 25 million and you do this and you say we're gonna get back to this in 10 years, we're still paying on 25. People are already upset about that. And then you're, if you don't pass in 10 years, then the work that you did 10 years prior is lost because you start getting into that, we're not maintaining, we're not doing everything that we need to be doing. Isn't that so that's, we're not, we're not talking about it though. What the 
was talking board. about. This, with, right. And so what I was talking was, about a right. single plan right. that the school board right. would approve that they feel that the community will support. Mm -hmm. That's a school board decision. We we provided facts for the school board to listen. So I guess my facts. question is why why does not the $50 million plan, the full renovation the charge, plan, the go charge to the board. said provide prioritized needs. That's what it says. If you look at the charge, I have it here. So, so that's so it, it and yes. so foundational. You can criticize this all you want, if but this is saying there is opportunity if there's further work done. We're not saying that's the final cause. Um, so in the interest of facts, I just, there is a lot of stuff in here that makes assumptions. And if to be confirmed, right. to be confirmed by additional work. So there's, there's things to me that seem like they're arbitrarily eliminated. And, um, and then there's a lot of guesswork in here. Um, to me, and you know, I do appreciate the scrutiny of going through those, but they, they said there's marginal errors to be expected, and potential savings are not the same thing as real savings. And when you go out for a project, first off, some of these tests, it's, it's premature to do them, and this is something that we've discussed. It's premature to do them until we've funded the project. When the project is funded, when the project has been determined, then you do those investments to determine. Votes did not that say was actually that one of the big them. differences between Mills Lawn and the high school was the amount of roof that was being anticipated to be replaced. There, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, so you got a budget for worst case scenario. And when you get into a project, if you get a lot of good news, that's when you say the project came in under budget, and that's great. That's when you can pay down the debt a little bit sooner. That's when you can lower the taxes a little bit sooner. But to, to, to cut them out of the budget without knowing, I mean, even if you core the roofs today, we're talking about a project that's not going to be funded until February of 2024, that's not going to be worked on until, yeah, I mean, so it's premature. You don't want to core the roofs two years. I mean, you're punching holes in the roof. We're not punching holes in the roof. That's what coring is. is. non <laughs> testing. We're not. Okay. We're well, not coring the roof. Yeah. So, I, I didn't say that you shouldn't do those tests, but I said those are things that you wait until a project is funded and decided on. And when you get good news, then, then you, it loosens up your budget a little bit. But if you get bad news, it's good to have that money there for the bad news. Let me pose a scenario to you, Jay. Let's say we decide to build a new school, and it's going to be $50 million, and it fails. The community won't support a $50 million new school, okay? The board needs to make a decision what they're going to ask the community to support. If the board feels that they feel that, that this community will support a $35 million project with the foundational and the, the uh, optional items, that's the board's decision. Correct. The, the, the whole crux of the matter is we know that there are some very serious needs for these schools. The question is, what is the community going to support? And that's a board decision. It's not, it's not this facilities com uh, <coughs> committee's decision. The facilities committee's uh, charge is to get accurate numbers to the board so they can make a decision. And the additional work helps get them accurate numbers. Can I ask a question? Can, then if, if, if you are going back to the charge of the committee and want to give a plan to the board at various price points, cannot one of those price points be Mike's complete plan? It is, sure. if that's what the board decides what they want to do. But it's not Mike's complete plan, it's a plan. It's a draft plan. I don't want to call that a complete plan because it was, we haven't even as a committee talked about that second list of things. 
community hasn't had a chance to. So, so I guess I guess we're we're confusing yeah. community and committee. The community there is there will be ample opportunity for the community to weigh in because the community I mean, hasn't weighed in on on the what I would call the foundational pieces. So why they're going to weigh in at this point, which I just don't think it's it, we're there yet on the educational piece. But I, mean, I think Mike's plan as presented, which included all of modes, which we know is, is not is not quite that amount, and THP. So in my mind, that's the complete plan. So when I say complete plan, that's what I mean, I'm referring to. The, the charge said that we would prioritize these. And we may, maybe, if, if, but do you think, if, the, if, 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 if I mean, we thought the educators would want to prioritize the we, we have. So you are saying they're all, they're all priorities. Absolutely. Okay, fine. Then well, what was given, my yeah. understanding is what was given in those conversations to you, Mike, was, was the prioritized needs from the administrators and from the okay. leaders so here. Those are all priorities. And, 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 and so when I give the word optional, and then it's an aspirational, I think it takes away from the work that the educators and the administrators have done here to say those are the things that we need. I just know that at Oakwood there were a couple of things they planned to do they didn't get to them because I'm assuming they had prioritized their needs and those things were at the end of the list and they ran out of money. So those are the things that well, didn't get done. I mean, I'm not sure. That's the, the way I... The school board said, this is how much money you got. This is how much you got. But, but, and then when you ran out of money, then those last two things didn't right, get accomplished. But, um, no. I think it's when we visited, you pointed out that there were new construction that was going to be done at Oakwood, that it was going to be founded by an LFI. No, privately funded. Privately funded, right? So the renovation plan at Oakwood was not the end all project. Right. There is private funding coming on top to do the things that were also important to the community. And I think I want to underline this that yes, Oakwood is an interesting comparison point, but it doesn't really quite apply to the situation in which we are here. And it would be really misleading or getting us off track if we wanted to stick with what Oakwood did. Because we didn't have the same starting point that we had. We didn't have. We don't have a private funding that they, that they have, and so those are different. But are very important. It would be misleading to keep pointing back to. Us. I don't think it's misleading, but I can acknowledge we disagree about whether it's relevant or not. I think it's relevant. You know, that's fine. We don't have to agree. I'd like to address the. Uh, whether you do the testing now or you wait till after your funding, to me it's like you have to do the testing before so you know if all that money you can save so then you can come back and ask for less from the community. So if you know that you can save four or five million dollars, well then you can just lop that off of the, the 50 or whatever your effect you're going to use and then you can say, okay, it won't cost us that much, but now we can ask for less so that it's it's much more conceivable that, that, uh, that your levy will pass because you don't have to ask quite as much money. Yeah, I just um, would be hesitant to use two-year-old data. Well, if the if the contractors that were that were that we would be using know what the situation is, they can you know the professionals. They that's what they do all the time. They would probably say, yes, you should be good for you know three years out to. Uh, yeah, I, it's just something that I would I would wait on until a project is fully funded. Then that cost can be incurred by the project to to do it. Um, we're we're two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars into facilities discussions without. Um, Since I've been on the school board, we're fifty thousand dollars. Yes, I mean, and um, yeah, and I would I am I am including. Uh, I'm, I wasn't on a facility. It's not an oh, issue okay. of assigning claim. I'm just, I'm just saying. We're, we're blame me. We're two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in. We're a year in, and we still feel the need to do one, two, three, four. I think four or five more assessments. I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to say, what happens when we do those, and then we say, well, we need more assessments. Then we're going to be another yeah. twelve months out. And, and, and we, it's kind of. I mean, to me, it's interesting that we're. We're cherry picking the news that we that we want. We say the buildings are sturdy and structurally sound. This is what the votes said, and then we're saying, well, they don't know what they're talking about with electrical panels, and they don't. So we're we're cherry picking the news that we want. 
about their inspection and they did a visual. We got a second visual. We need to do some testing to verify the fuse boxes and the wiring thing. Okay. It's data, solid data. Do we want to get? Okay. Is there anything more you guys want to say? And then I was going to say maybe we should hear some citizens in the room. Can I say something first? Yeah. Just a minute. I'm going to put my mom hat on, my teacher hat, my principal hat, every hat I wear um, on for this. I feel like we are really talking in circles and we are not, <laughs> we, are, we are not coming to an agreement, which is understandable when you have 14 people around the table and, and a few people missing. To me, and maybe I'm wrong, it sounds like we are maybe at a point where we let the board decide. We have a, um, a plan that he did with a number, and then we have an option on the table where we have this foundational plan, and we need to decide if we're doing testing now or you just say, um, hey, we came in under budget. And then we have the additional items. Um, I don't like the term, but the additional items that the building experts have already prioritized. So why why are we continuing to talk when it really sounds like, look, we have a plan. We have a plan where we can do the testing now, or we have a plan where we say, hey, we don't do the testing and we come under budget. But to me, it sounds like the committee has done a lot of work. I appreciate all the work that the building experts have done. I appreciate all of the work that the, the school experts have done. But it sounds like we're not really getting anywhere, and it might be time to let the board make that decision of when we do the testing and what is the price point they want to go with. I agree. Yeah. Folks out there, I, I have some comments I'd like yeah, to make. Really yeah. uh, I, I have a couple of visual aids, if that's possible, to, to assist so that I don't have to say as much. Um, we, it seems to me that we have had a lot of talk about um, our charge and, and what the point is. and. Um, in thinking about this over the weekend, I decided it was an appropriate time to go back and look at the history of community involvement in this problem. And so the first thing I did was I looked up the charges of the 2017-18 group and the 2020, 2020, whatever the middle one was, as well as ours. So this was the charge of the 2017-2018 group. I'm not going to read it. Um, I like it. It's numbered. That's, that goes well with my left brain style. It's numbered. It's um, it's educationally sound. It starts with we're going to determine what the educational needs are. We're going to look at the facility. We're going to make this assessment. We're going to make a recommendation to the board. The board's going to decide. We're going to share it with the community. There'll be lots of input. It'll be good. I like that. That failed. You know, I, I think that was done, but. Moving on to 2021, we had the community advisory team, same idea, and this was their charge. A uh, little more concise, not numbered, it's just my personal thing, but uh, again, it starts with the educational needs, look at the facilities conditions, develop a, a, an appropriate master plan. Again, I have no problem with any of that. Now let's look at ours. Now the first thing I learned in studying systems analysis is that one of the most important things you do is you understand and then define the problem in a really clear way. The second thing I learned in system analysis is you cannot define a problem as the absence of your preferred solution. So I can't say, well, the problem, that, you know, the problem is that I, I don't have a super duper TV in my basement. That, that's not the problem. <laughs> that's the absence of my preferred solution to the problem. I, I want to say that I have, um, it, it seems to me that the, there's a stark difference between this charge and the previous two. The previous two 
seem to be done in a, a fairly conventional style, as I pointed out. Um, and here we are being asked to kind of validate a, a solution to the problem. Um, I, I just don't, I don't think that's, that's appropriate. Um, and I don't think it's productive. We've talked a lot about what did the voters said, what did the voters say, what does the community want? Um, and that's exactly what we should be talking about. Um, uh, because it is ultimately the voters who are going to make this decision. So we're doing no service to the Board of Education if we help them develop a plan that the voters won't approve. We're just not. Um, in, in 2019, the board commissioned a, a study, I believe they commissioned a study, there was a survey done after the 2018 vote, and they quantified reasons that people supported or, or opposed the levy, the, the, the issue. They got 150 responses, and I'm going to give you my quick top 10 list here. Um, this was composed from the letters to the editor package that's, that's in our, our document dump as well as the, uh, the survey results. Uh, number one, to no surprise, it's too expensive, the affordability argument. That's a valid argument. No, no one in this room, I think, disagrees with that. Another one was that it's too expensive, not the affordability argument, but, well, we, we don't want to Taj Mahal, or, you know, we haven't spent the money we gave you previously well, it's not, other existing facilities haven't been maintained well, I, I just can't see myself spending money to throw, throw more money at you. Um, folks said, well, we, the problem with it is it only addresses one building. It only looks at the high school and middle school. It doesn't say anything about Mills Lawn. Again, perfectly valid objection. Um, a lot of folks said, well, we, it relies on the OFCC report. We, we don't like the OFCC. We don't believe they have credibility. Um, we, we think there's a second opinion needed. We don't have any local input into that. I'll buy all that. Um, another objection was, well, um, and this was really more of the 2021 vote, uh, it's a single K-12 campus. We don't like that idea. Or, or maybe we, we don't mind the K-12 campus if it's only out on Enon Road, or again, if it's only on in the center of town, or the opposite. That's an issue. Um, there is the uh, sustainability argument. Again, a completely value, valid argument that I understand and, and am behind in my heart. That it's much better to renovate and repair than, than it is to throw stuff away and just build, build brand new things. Um, then we get to the green space argument, which I love, no one in this room loves green space more than I do. Um, but I'm sorry, the green space argument last time was a complete perversion of, of a social issue that had no business being part of the decision about what we do to solve the school facilities issue. Uh, they were completely conflated, and there was no reason for that. We can address the need for green space. We can make sure that people's love for the Mills Lawn green space is taken care of. And, and that doesn't need to be part of whether we, we should improve the school facilities or not. And then finally, we've got the mistrust of the Board of Education and or the campaign committee. And this is where I, this is why I'm here. I desperately want to be part of the solution to this problem and not part of the problem itself. Um, whether it was right or wrong, there was a perception that the board did not listen to people. That's all through the letters to the editor. Some people were offended by what they called scare tactics. There was the dreaded pamphlet with the, the, the folks thought was a scare tactic. And I'm not judging whether that it was or not, people thought that. Some people were offended by the fact that money was spent on a PR firm to promote the second levy. I don't really get that problem, I guess I do, but that's routinely done everywhere that I know of. Um, the complaint was made that the process was rushed in 2017. Here we are five years later, and we're still talking about it, so I, I don't know whether that's valid anymore, but it was a complaint that was made. And then, of course, we had all the misinformation, disinformation, social media disaster that, that was part of that. Um, my, my point in, in all of this is that I would respectfully 
reject the idea that we can logically conclude that there was any single reason why the voters turned down the two school issues in 2018 and 2021. Uh, and, and I I do not believe it's helpful for us to act like any of us know that, it, that there was. I think there were a lot of things at play. Some of them maybe didn't deserve to be at play, and some of them certainly did, but we need to be able to compartmentalize a little bit and deal with this stuff separately. Otherwise, we end up exactly where Megan said we are. We're just talking in circles. Um, we're, we're not being productive. Um, and I just think we've got, to, we've got to be better than that. I believe personally, I have been on record on several occasions saying I started this thinking that the, the way to go was to renovate Mills Lawn and to, and to do something different with the high school. Um, that's the board's call to make. Uh, that is the board's call to make, and I'm, I'm for making it. But I would love to see the board, whatever decision they make, I like, I would like to think that it was a unanimous decision that they pulled together on this. Not that, that we've got a 3-2 board and we've got factions and all that kind of stuff. There are these kids out there and they are the most treasured resource of this community and we've got people that work in these facilities every day whose life work, life's work is, is carried out in these places and we owe them more than we're giving them. That's what I have to say. Thank you. So, so I just want to uh, state a couple things. First, um, you know, when at the start of this, Judith and Dorothy, we met in my office when we were discussing my participation in this, and I told you at the very beginning that I was biased towards new facilities, but I would approach this with an open mind. And I will tell you, after going through this process and talking with Mike about what deep renovation could be, I am 100% open to a renovation. So so my mindset has changed and, and I think there's even opportunity for more creative solutions that the board could pursue that this, that this committee was not charged with and has not touched, but I trust that the board could pursue those things. So, so my comments really are with that idea that I'm open to anything on the table and I trust that we have a great board that will put forth the, the appropriate thing for the community. Um, I also want to thank everybody for their time and passion on this committee. Um, you know, when I sit in meetings and, and I see people um, emotionally charged, I think that's actually a sign of health because you have the right people who are passionate about the conversation. And, and I, I value that back and forth banter and I think it can be healthy um, in many cases. When, when I look at the plan here, my biggest push or encouragement is that we, we look in terms of um, longevity and efficiency with, with the money we're spending. So, so if we can save a little bit of money now on, a, on Windows, great, but where are we going to be in five years or 10 years or 20 years? And, and that's not to say to just wholesale replace everything. But I, I guess I encourage us to think about really big picture, if we're gonna do a renovation, that renovation serves our kids and our community for, for 30 years or 40 years that we're not coming back to, to taxpayers in 15 years saying, hey, we need more. Um, so, so whether that be a new build, whether that be deep renovation, whatever, that would be one of my, my pieces of encouragement. And then my second one is, I really have concern about the, the use of the terms foundational and additional, and I, I know that Mike did not mean anything negative when he came up with those terms, um, but I think the last couple bond issues have been hampered by misinformation. And I think when you use the term foundational, people latch onto that term and they say, oh, anything beyond that is a luxury and it's not necessary. And, and I don't think that's an accurate perception. And, and like, for example, in this case, the foundational does not include an ADA compliant band room in this building. So, so like, I just, my, my push would be, we are, I think as we most of us agree, at a spot where it's time to hand this back over to the board. Um, but, but I would encourage the board to make sure that, you know, we're looking at big picture, long-term, 
um, good use of taxpayers' money and, and doing something that does right by our kids for a long time. I wanted to maybe be here. I know you I didn't, I didn't want to say anything. Okay, I just want to be able to hear from these folks over here before. Okay. <coughs> I wanted to ask, uh, I, I know that you've come up with a plan here and, and that you found redundancy, redundancy in the budget for months, and I appreciate that. I wanted to ask if we could add back, if we could add back all of the requests uh, of the administrators and teachers here. So all the ones that have been taken out. For instance, I'm thinking about the changes in the floor plan that we have at Mills Lawn that would allow for small group spaces to be existing in the building. I know that those have been taken out. Can we add back, uh, you know, the sufficient storm shelter so that we can take the pressure off those different pinch points that we have in the room? Can we add that back? So that would be a complete plan without the, uh, taking into account the redundancy that they have found. So that would be, that's the plan that I think will be the most viable here. So that would not be that, that would not be the original 50 million, that would be without the redundancy that they found with the 83 exterior doors and so forth. I do, I have, I, I'm, I'm, a little hesitant about some of the assumptions that were made there, you know, the 20% of the windows and the 50% of the plumbing. Like you say, we need further tests for that. But let's, we do, we, we have a duty of having a conservative budget that plans for the worst. We, I do think that this is our duty to the community so that we do not come back into your say, actually, we need more money. So in terms of presenting a plan to the board, that would be, I think, the the request that I have here is that we use that and we add all of those requests, educational adequacy requests that have been taken out of that. I've got one thing. So I was part of the task force, and that was actually 19 and 20. It was after the first failed levy. One of the things that came out of that was we're all talking about one-time purchase, either renovation or a new build. But what came out of the task force was the need to increase our maintenance budget to increase the, you're gonna build a new one, you're gonna renovate it, you still have to maintain it. And what we saw was the budget that, that the school district has to operate, maintenance of any level is not sufficient to meet it. So we're talking about a one-time deal, but I think there's also an increase in maintenance levy, or I, I don't know, again, all the levies, but that was one of the biggest recommendations that came out of that. I agree that the, the terminology we're using for foundational, additional, we did in the task force, we prioritized, we ended up with medium, high, and low. Um, that didn't take away, some of the low stuff could be done when you're doing the medium or the high. You know, I, I, I think the foundational or the plan, the complete plan, and I, I didn't like that terminology because that could mean two different things, right? One is, that's the entirety of the plan, it's a draft complete plan, not a done plan, right? So I think when you first did that, you, you sat down, we didn't do iterations on it, it was a one-time thing, and I think it's a valid starting point to look at that incorporated the, the necessary uh, plumbing systems that are required, as well as educational requirements from the community as well. So I, I wanna make sure we don't lose the levies that are going to be required or, or the payment for future maintenance of these buildings. That's the PHP for permanent improvement. Okay, right. Let's hear from citizens a little bit. Anyone want to Abby and then John. Well, it looks like John's been eager, John. so go ahead, John. <laughs> and sorry. then I'll go after you. Yeah, it's just the, your charge um, calls on you to present plans at various price points. And um, you guys said that your uh, needs, you've already prioritized them. And the found I mean, basically, I'm, I'm also going to dogpile on this term foundational. Obviously, what's, what's going to be presented to the board would be only complete and finished plans. Um, so why, and if your, if your uh, needs are already prioritized, then uh, the, the one that you guys are calling complete could be one of the plans at one of the price points, 
and then you could cut off a couple of the low priority things, and that could be one, and then cut off a couple more low priority things, and then that could be another one, right? Like, boom. But they have different priorities, yes? They're not all the same priority level. <laughs> but in any case, you're basically, it doesn't seem, the foundational plan is talking about foundational is only confusing the matter. It, the foundational as elements is just a is just the first step towards developing mul um, multiple complete plans at different price at differing price points. Clearly, I, I can't imagine any other reasonable way way of doing it. Um, secondly, to say to uh, and say uh, potential you. potential savings <laughs> is to me ex exceedingly okay. unclear and sort of bearing the point, which is that the um, price tag that the board would be considering would be highly uncertain to, to say, well, this plan that we're considering might cost between 34 and $42 million is like ridiculous, especially when you're considering that they're trying to, that they're, they would be supposed to informally compare such a plan with building new. Um, obviously, a lot of the elements in the uncertain, in the potential savings are, would affect any plan. Um, so it might not necessarily affect your relative comparison of renovation plans, but it would seriously inhibit your ability to compare with, to informatively compare with building new. Clearly, you have to spend the money to um, to reduce that uncertainty. You can't have eight million dollars worth of uncertainty. He's not saying like, oh yeah, this is the case, and like, you know, it's definitely going to cost eight million dollars less. He's saying that he thinks it would cost eight million dollars less. We need to know. We, like, if it's the worst case scenario, we need to know that we're going to be spending that, and that could help. That could help inform and influence whether or not we want to buy new or not. Right? It's um, always the worst case scenario. Uh, it's, okay. That's that's. But my we experience. need to know. You can't. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop you, oh, I Abby, and I am going to um, do three minutes. So I, I will Sorry. do my best. And these are complex issues. I, I want to start out by Abby saying, Cobb, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Abigail Cobb, and I am a grandparent of uh, current students, and I served on the 2019 Facilities Committee with Chris Hamilton. And I, I want to go to something that Terry Holden said, which is, uh, in 1952, there were community leaders, such as Wally Sykes, uh, et cetera, who, who built schools that lasted, they've lasted well. My husband and I were born in 1952. He went to kindergarten at Mills Lawn, and our oldest grandchild is graduating this year from the high school. So these buildings have been around a long time. They're foundational to the community. I served on the 2019 task force, and I want to tell you I feel a little insulted, especially from you, Mr. Papania, uh, when you question the OFCC assessment, the Fanning Howey assessment. This is the MOTS assessment has been our third paid assessment. And the information that we have received has been very similar. I know that I supported the 2018 levy and I supported the 2021 levy. When you talk about the community and what the community wants, over a third of us supported the new bill levy last time. So be careful when you talk about what the community wants. I don't know, Mr. Papania, why I should trust you and this committee uh, more than the OFCC, more than Fanning Howey, more than the, than the MOATS assessment. That really concerns me. With the possible exception of yourself, it sounds like your, your professional background has to do with building facilities. No one else here has built buildings, let alone public buildings. And I'm really, I, I'm concerned that people want to be trusted here over the opinions of professionals. I, I, I want to say that uh, I, I, what I'm not hearing in the so-called foundational plan is the fact that the roofs are, have a poor design. I've, been, I've heard that said. Why should we replace and rebuild these roofs when the design is bad? What about the seventh and eighth grade shoebox that's been 
a very emotional issue for more than five years. What about the ADA non-compliant high school music room? What about the kitchens? Our high school students have come before the board and said, we want to be able to eat better food, but without new kitchens, we can't have that. What about the sidewalk? Right outside here where I walked from Abigail, my car. Abigail, three minutes are up, so you can just I, finish up. I, I'm going to finish. I didn't hear about the sidewalks being repaired. There's a lot that I'm not hearing, and I think that we're going to get to $50 million of renovation very soon uh, with all these added issues. I don't understand why, knowing that, that the renovation is going to cost very similar to a new build, why we wouldn't choose a new build where the long-term cost will be less, having a single campus. If you read about K-12 education, there are so many benefits to it. I would like that addressed. I'm going, I'm going to finish with one last statement, which is I believe that the win-win solution here is a new build and also uh, a preserved Mills Lawn. And I'd like to see community discussions facilitated by some of the communication professionals that we have in this community. Ari Associates with Jay Rothman, the, the Village Mediation. I'd like to see some real discussions facilitated because like Mr. Hatter, I too would like to be really part of a solution. Thank you. Mary. Hi, Mary Eby, community member. Um, it just It's great to hear that you're almost finished, or finished, per how things are decided. Um, it seems critical to me, I think many people in the community, to absolutely finish if these assessments can help define what the numbers are. It seems critical to do these assessments for the relatively small amount of money that they are. So everyone, school board, superintendent, treasurer, teacher, staff, community, everybody can be a part of the next steps. Thank you, Facilities Committee. Thank you, all of you. Um, I don't know who you are, so if you want to introduce yourself. My name is Bia Uh I also belong to the community. I just want to say bravo to the committee for all the work and uh, all the findings. Um, I saw some of it, I mean, in one of the reports, with, um, I think there were uh, photographs of uh, the st uh, problems at Miss Lawn, and I thought everything was plausible, I mean, what was in these reports and what needed to be done. And I'm glad for the findings of where to save money, because that is important to the community. And um, I wish I had such a maintenance committee for my house, uh, which is was probably built in 1850 or so. It's on the first map of Yellow Springs, and it's still standing. <laughs> and it's standing precisely because it has always been added onto, and also because there was maintenance. Because the people who lived in there actually liked the building. And um, I attribute this to the fact that they kept making it bigger. Um, because they could have done someplace else, perhaps. Or perhaps they couldn't, because they are on a budget. Like a lot of people will be, perhaps, in the foreseeable future here. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you for your work. Okay, keep at it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did catch your name. My name is Beatrix Karthaus Hyphen Hunt, H U N T. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess I just want to say there. Oh, sorry, Naomi Bongiorno. Sorry, did I cut in front of somebody? No. Um, that there is an additional cost that I still haven't seen in here, which is what to do with the kids while we're renovating. And I really just want to make sure that that's not forgotten. Um, it's a financial cost. It's also a huge emotional burden and a, a learning loss cost, which is <coughs> not, you can't put that in a spreadsheet. Um, and I guess I would also just throw out there that spending money on these additional assessments, it's not a we do it or we don't do it. That's not the question. I think clearly if renovation is the plan, we have to do it. Um, it's just about when we do it. And I would, I would rather not see more money be put into assessments unless we decide that's what we're gonna do. That renovation is what we're gonna do. And I think that you could actually show, you know, for this line item, it's a range of this to this. This is our best, every, anytime you do a renovation, 
it's an estimate, right? I mean, that's what it is. And I always ask if somebody, if a contractor is going to do work, I want the estimates to be high because I don't want surprises. Um, I would imagine, if I was a school board member, I would be comfortable looking at a list of items with details and a, a cost range and say this could cost this much, it could cost this much if you decide that the high, that within that range is acceptable based on whatever we think the community will support, which is incredibly amorphous, as Scott said, um, then you do the assessment. So I'm, I'm all for digging more in. I just don't know if we should be doing it now. And thank you, everybody, for all your hard work. Um, yeah, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name's Matthew Kirk. I'm a parent of a fourth grader at Mills Lawn. And, uh, you know, I've been following this committee as, yeah, as I've been going through this process now for the third time. And um, I think we've missed some opportunities here. Uh, we seem to have, as Scott alluded to, have started this process with kind of a destination in mind and have kind of been crafting our way towards that. And even now, after we have the plan, we didn't just present one comprehensive plan. We presented these two options, even though there's really not two options. So again, the product of the committee is already leading into this disinformation like channel, because we have not been able to unify even around a common language. I listened to you guys at the table arguing about what words mean, which means we don't have a common set of facts, right? Because everybody's interpreting things on their own. You know, what I do know is as several people alluded to is we're gonna to have to have a plan that will pass in the community. And again, part of that means that we have to have a common set of facts, a common narrative. And it also means, you know, that I guess you have to take your opportunities in life and if you don't ask for things, you're never gonna get them. So I don't really understand why we would possibly take a bare bones approach to asking the community for the resources that the schools need. We've, we've established what is needed. The educational team has said what is needed. We've established the, the mechanical uh, and envelope needs are of the building. Uh, what we haven't necessarily established, and this is for the school board, it's the political will to do it. But we know what needs done. And I guess if what needs done can't happen, you guys have done a lot of work towards the bare bones plan. And if you know we can't get it together as a community, maybe that's our option of last resort. But why would we possibly go down that road to begin with? start with I guess it's aspirational to have mediocre schools um, but do the aspirational thing then Judith go for it let's just have like the same base level schools as everybody else you talk about Oakwood part of the reason Oakwood's able to do a renovation like they were able to do is because back when they built their building they spent money on high quality materials they're gonna last a long time that building is on the National Register of Historic Places we didn't do that stuff so what we need to do is get to that kind of standard. Then maybe in the future we could do that kind of plan. But we're not there. So, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Introduce yourself. No, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Cindy C. Uh, both of my kids graduated from Illinois High School. Um, I want to kind of pick, on, pick up on what uh, John was saying about these, these price points. And to me, where I see where that makes sense is that it allows you all as a committee to say here's plan one from that long list it includes a b c d here's plan two it includes a b c d e f here's plan three it includes a to z then the school board makes a decision what kind of what kind of total cost do they think that the community will be willing to accept because the bottom line is this needs to get us to a levy that will pass we, we have to have something that will pass and, and it makes sense to me that looking at these different plans even though we all may have a preference for one gives us then the opportunity for the school board who makes that decision to talk about what's involved in each what the trade-offs are how that might compare to what we build and make a decision about what levy they can put forward that they think will pass Uh, I'm Ashley Fulton. I'm a fifth grade teacher. It's my uh, third time speaking. Um, my main number one concern are my students and my children. I really could, I can handle a lot. I'm an adult. Um, so we want to do renovations. That's fine if that's what's best for our community, that it will pass and will help our kids become better at everything they need. However, what I feel like we're not addressing is displacement of us for fifth grade for 12 to 15 months and if construction goes like it did for when I did things in my house, way longer than that. 
um, you're talking about wherever we would end up, how much that costs, where we would have to move, go, move back. What will that do to our open enrolled children? Um, will they want to be displaced and stay with our district? My open enrolled children are just as important as the kids that live in this village. They are not the ones that we for some reason want to forget or do all those things where why are we building buildings for kids that don't live there? That's, that's not true. Teachers love our open enrolled kids just as much. But will we lose those kids when they're already coming from Dayton, Springfield, all those places? It's, I'm really passionate about it, I'm sorry. Um, but that's my thing. We have to consider how much displacement will cost to our children, our finances, and our teachers, and will teachers stay? I will stay. I'm an invested member. My kids are here. But will that family stay that wants to not deal with that? Think about the kid who will finish their senior year in a displaced environment. Think about that five and six year old spending their kindergarten year on a bus for God knows how long for a displaced environment. That's what you need to look at. Not us, that 17, 18 year old and that five and six year old. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Oh. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Kathy, and I've attended K through Adams. 12. <laughs> Kathy Adams. <laughs> I attended K through 12 here, and, and our kids have too, and they've just graduated the most recent, 2020. And I was so, so elated to hear Jack say that it changes mine about renovation. And I've been hearing from Mike about it, and he said it really looks like new, you know? and. I think it's all about money. And I think it would be a, a great disservice to our community to go with all of this that you want. I, I, I hope that the school board will listen to these different price points and decide what the community can bear. Because we only got 1,800 households. We're totally different than anyone else around. We have a lot of kids that are on the free and reduced lunch. And we have a lot of people that are living on the edge in this town, including seniors. And we do have a very high number of seniors as well. So this is a very different community and you have to consider that when you're looking at how much you're asking the community to bear. Because the main thing is we want to get it passed. And I hope that the board will consider the great work that the facilities committee is doing to try to save our community money and serve the needs of all of our children and all of our staff and make it a better environment for them educationally. And um, I appreciate what Scott said about that as well. And uh, oh, there's one other thing I was going to say and I forget what it is right now. But thank you very much. I hope you listen. Thank you. Um, is that everyone out there? Oh, can I? I oh. just remembered what it was. You know, I, I sat through the excruciating length of all the Zoom meetings that you all were in <laughs> and watched every minute of it. And they're not questioning. I didn't hear anyone on the facilities committee saying, oh, Moat, you're wrong, or, or THP, you're wrong, THK. Um, they were just simply pointing out discrepancies and discussing it. And, and Moat and THP said they, w they did make a few mistakes, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody's perfect. And uh, I think it is definitely worthwhile giving them a $10,000, I guess, is what you're asking for these other these other, that's a drop in the bucket when it comes to the school budget. And it could save us potentially way more than that. And then you might have a lot better chance of getting a levy passed. I'm done. Thank you. I'm Cecily Slaughter. I live in the village. I do have a high school student, but she does not attend here. My concern is for all the students. I think a reconstruction because there is a reduced cost on some things, there are savings. It doesn't have to be cheap. It doesn't have to mean poor quality. I do agree with Ms. Fox that we are getting close to a point where we should present that to the board to let them make a decision. 
Um, I would like to say, as far as Mr. Pompanea, I applaud all that you do. I really think the Facilities Committee has done a great job in a place of turmoil. Yellow Spring seems to thrive on that. But I applaud what you've done, the information that you found. And lastly, when someone knows their subject, someone knows their craft, it's okay to question. It's okay. If you know your subject and you know your craft, you defend what you have put down on paper. If it's incorrect, or it can be adjusted, then you go back to the table and you say, well, maybe we can make some adjustments and still make it work for everybody. It doesn't have to be insulting. It doesn't have to be demeaning. It's a discussion. Smart people come to the table, they work together, they dialogue, and they come together with a solution for the greater good of everyone, which means the community, the parents, the children, and the teachers. That's all. Okay. Well, I feel like we're kind of done for the night. Um, we, I, 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 I have a... You're, okay, you're not, okay, go ahead. <coughs> um, a couple real quick things. Um, I guess I would just caution about just getting a levy that will pass. Because if you just pass and we don't do enough, then we need more later on. And if we don't get more later on, what you just passed is going to be thrown away. And that's why I advocate for addressing all systems like all the abatement. That's why I advocate for the total plan. Um, so it, it, it's more important than just passing a levy. It's passing a levy that sustains the for a foreseeable future. And um, we can get into this, but. Uh, if it's just about cost, then, then I think I think I know what I would do. But um, I think it's about more than just cost. So Thank you. I do I do want to just say finally, uh, the building professionals and I think spending that extra money, that extra doing those extra assessments will be important to the community. Now I'm just saying finishing saying that. I've heard not everybody agrees with that. I know the committee is not going to be in agreement, so we don't need to vote on it. Or but we just think it makes sense and that the community is going to want that. I know TJ, our president of our school board, is, is talking about having a listening session for the public, um, you know, for the school board to listen to the public. Um, and um, we'll find out how important it is to people, because people well, I'm sure are going to be aware of this conversation. I guess you know, there's nobody saying it has to happen tomorrow, but I, that is our feeling: is that it would make sense to go forward with those uh, assessments. Uh, no, I was directing to what Brian, because I think you wanted to say something. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, no, Brian. Did you want to say? Go to there. Any last? Is there anything last? Anybody needs to say or can call it? I'll I'll take the last minute. <laughs> Something I'd like to point out is that our schools, our buildings, our educational programs have never been staffed. The, every one of these buildings that we're talking about have been changed multiple times since they were built. They have been remodeled, they've been added to, they've been subtracted from, we've built buildings and sold them. We've done a lot of different things. We're not going to find the perfect solution for the next X number of years. Okay. We're going to make improvements, and we but we have to know that it won't be the be all end all. It will not be. Okay. The needs we don't know. We talk about the educational needs of today. Okay. We don't know what the educational needs of tomorrow are. Right. And yes, we need to meet the educational needs of today. But we also have to realize that what we're doing is an ongoing process. So there's the maintenance, there's flexibility in what we build so that we can change it when we need to. This, this building has had rooms opened up, closed back up, cafeterias enlarged, decreased, kitchens enlarged, decreased. We keep changing our minds about what we want. And we have to understand that. Okay? So a certain amount of realization that no matter what 
we can gather all the information we can gather, but we all are going to have to have some flexibility because none of us know exactly what it is. Richard. All right, if, if everybody's set, we'll, we'll thank you very much for everybody's participation, including you folks out there. Thank you.